All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our How to Make Change Advocacy 101 webinar training. We've had a fantastic uh, series of webinars over the past few months, but this one is special because it is the first of a new series uh, centered around our new volunteer program. Uh, a number of you have already signed up to be a Jews for Secular Democracy volunteer, but if you haven't yet, don't worry. I will send you uh, the link in the chat later on. Um, and the good news is that just by joining us tonight, you have done, uh, you're halfway there to becoming a Jews for a Secular Democracy volunteer. The second thing uh, that uh, all you'll need to do uh, for a next step is to join our Communications 101 webinar, which is coming up soon, where you'll learn about press relations and how to communicate effectively uh, through digital and how to uh, be persuasive on the issues that we care about. So more information on that soon. I am going to provide a very, very brief overview of the Jews for a Secular Democracy program for those who may not be familiar, the mission and scope, uh, the kinds of issues that we're focused on, um, the kinds of actions that you can take, and um, probably most importantly, the kinds of resources that are available from Jews for a Secular Democracy staff, such as myself and our community organizer, Lincoln Dow. And so with that, I'm gonna jump right in uh, so that we have plenty of time uh, to hear from our featured speaker today, Morgan Carroll. All right, so the mission of Jews for a Secular Democracy is to galvanize the Jewish community to defend the separation of church and state. There are fantastic organizations that work on, uh, secular organizations that work on separation of church and state, and there are phenomenal Jewish organizations that work on social justice issues. Jews for a Secular Democracy is uniquely uh, working to defend the separation of church and state from the Jewish perspective. This is a pluralistic initiative. We believe very strongly that advocating for religious freedom and separation of church and state benefits people of all faiths and none. Um, and we are working with uh, folks in the Jewish community of all, all different faith uh, and tradition, uh, faith backgrounds and traditions, whether you're Orthodox, you're Reform, you're humanistic, non-religious. Uh, we have shared values, we have a shared experience. And again, we feel that the church state separation conversation, uh, Jews, given our experience in the United States and our, our history as a religious minority, uh, really informs and inspires why we feel so strongly about strong protections for religious minorities and keeping religion and government separate. We also are not uh, afraid to talk about the rise of religious fundamentalism, particularly Christian nationalism in the United States. And so we are for a pluralistic vision of the United States that separates religion and government, respects the rights of people of all faiths and none, but we also wanna name and shame the Christian nationalism that is promoting a very specific and narrow set of beliefs um, over others and undermining civil rights in the process. And so there's kind of two aspects of what we do in this program, we're challenging narrative, we're also challenging policy. Um, reject, we're rejecting policies guided by one religion's version of so-called family values. And I also want to point out, you know, Christian nationalism, Christian nationalists in no way, shape or form represent the majority of Christians, although they, they claim to. Um, and this kind of cultural dominance over morality and right and wrong, um, you know, and, and all the things that are kind of built into this idea of family values is, is really an agenda that does not uh, align with our Jewish values. Uh, we also are talking about the narrative of Judeo-Christian values and how problematic it is. Um, it, it is really trying to uh, make itself sound very inclusive, um, but really it is promoting a Christian nationalist agenda that is certainly not to the benefit of Jews uh, or religious minorities generally. And so we are really trying to have more of a conversation about what the underlying agenda of those who say Judeo-Christian values nowadays uh, really is, why it's problematic, um, and, and calling it out. And then of course, uh, again, really uh, leveraging the history and, and lessons from history and our experience as Jews in the United States and, and historically uh, to bring that perspective uh, when we talk about things like human rights, um, refugee rights, and a bunch of other issues that tie into church state separation and speak to our experience as Jews. And that brings me to our policy agenda. And the next slide will have a few more examples, but just a, a sampling of things that we're talking about. We're talking about license to discriminate policies that basically create massive loopholes where you can 
get out of non-discrimination um, statutes uh, by claiming to have a religious liberty to discriminate. Um, immigrant, immigrant and refugee rights, uh, women's rights, in particular reproductive health, uh, LGBTQ rights. We, we know that all too often um, LGBTQ rights, the, the hard-won civil rights that we've seen over the past um, few years have been undermined time and time again through these religious liberty arguments um, and protecting universal access to secular education. And so this next slide is really uh, just a few examples of how this all ties in, ties in. all these issues tie into secular government and Jewish values from our perspective as uh, the Jews for Secular Democracy Initiative. So with things like immigration and refugee rights, we saw the Muslim ban, which was essentially a religious litmus test for entering the country. Uh, we also know that the rise of white supremacy uh, does overlap with uh, Christian nationalism um, and very much influences uh, immigration and refugee policy. You might remember when the former Attorney General Jeff Sessions quoted the Bible to justify family separation. Uh, we with women's rights, uh, and this is uh, these are all just kind of a few examples, uh, but the personhood agenda is very much faith-based and imposing a very specific religious viewpoint about where life begins and, and contraception, all those things on all other women of all faiths um, and none. Uh, we're talking about things like LGBTQ rights, um, as I mentioned before, just as an example, we're seeing uh, an increase in bills that are basically allowing adoption and foster care agencies that receive state funding to discriminate on the basis of religion. So they're taking taxpayer dollars, but then saying to otherwise perfectly qualified parents, we're not going to adopt you or let you um, participate in our foster care program because you are uh, Jewish, you are uh, an interfaith couple, you're uh, same sex, uh, you know, you don't fit our specific idea of what a family should look like while also taking taxpayer dollars. Um, we're talking about access to secular education. We did a great webinar a few months ago on this topic, so I really encourage you to uh, watch that. I'll try to link to that in the chat later on. Um, a few things we're seeing in legislatures are Bible class electives where these bills kind of go right up to the line of what's allowed um, and what it really ends up doing is opening the door for the Bible to be taught as fact in public schools. Uh, we're seeing academic freedom bills, uh, which make it really hard for teachers uh, to teach science as fact, uh, opening the door for students to answer the questions wrong on a test or on their homework, uh, say on a question of evolution, um, or things like that on the basis of their academic or religious freedom um, and, you know, just kind of making it harder and harder to teach science in a secular public school setting. Um, the climate crisis and science denial, I mean, this has really been exposed right now, uh, especially during the pandemic where we see public health experts sidelined um, and the attacks on Dr. Fauci, so on and so forth. Uh, we, we really do feel that it, it's not just about disentangling religion and government where we're against making policy on the basis of religion what we're for is policy on the basis of reason and science and evidence um, and when we see censorship of scientific reports or just sidelining public health or uh, officials or undermining they're trying to undermine their credibility for political reasons um, that's that's a real problem for that impacts all of us in terms of our, our health <laughs> uh, um, and also our rights. Uh, and so it, it touches, of course, on the climate cr uh, crisis, but scientific integrity certainly does also tie into church state separation and our Jewish values in that way as well. And so that just, that's a very, very quick overview of the kinds of issues that fall into our scope of mission as Jews for Secular Democracy and the kind of issues that we're thinking about. And so once you finish uh, tonight's webinar and you participate in our next communications webinar uh, that I mentioned earlier, you'll be officially a Jews for Secular Democracy volunteer and you'll be hopefully really excited to get started. And so here are a few things that we're going to be asking you to do. Um, we're going to want you to start uh, assemble a startup team, a core group of volunteers who want to work with you. You're going to want to define your objectives and the next slide I'll have a few examples of the kinds of actions that you can take. Uh, we're very aware that what you're going to want to focus on is going to depend entirely on the state that you live on, live in, the amount of volunteers that you have, your volunteer capacity, your interests, um, what makes sense, what's timely. 
Um, and so defining your objective is going to be that process of kind of figuring out what makes sense for us here. You know, what folks in California are going to do or is going to be totally different from what folks in Texas or Colorado might be doing. And then once you define your objectives, you're going to want to think about your strategy or timeline for achieving the objectives. And again, it's gonna depend on what you wanna do. If you're trying to focus on introducing legislation in your state legislature or opposing legislation in your state legislature, that's gonna be a very different timeline than if you're focused on getting out the vote and voter protection, because obviously that's very uh, short timeline, right? We're, we're looking at November and all the things that you would be doing leading up to November, uh, where you would have a longer timeline and strategy accompanying that timeline uh, if you're looking at your state legislature and our speaker who's coming up in, in just a few minutes can really speak to that um, in detail. And then once you have your strategy and your timeline, you're going to be recruiting volunteers and partners and all of this throughout this whole process. We at Jews for a Second Democracy are here to help you. Uh, you've got me, you've got Lincoln Dow, our community organizer. Uh, we are here to help you think through your objectives, your timeline, and reaching out to partners on the ground, uh, both within your community, especially if you're part of um, the humanistic Jewish movement um, or the Jewish community, we can help connect you with folks, but also when you're doing outreach and coalition building, we're happy to help you with that as well. And once you kind of have your partnerships, you have your core group, you know what you're about to do, you want to really hone in on your messaging and how you're going to be persuasive and make sure that everyone involved is on the same page about how you're talking about the issue that you're trying to make change about. Um, all of these things are we talk about in more detail in our advocacy toolkit. So don't worry, uh, we have there's more where this came from. I just wanted to give you a, a, a very brief overview of the kind of uh, next steps that we're looking for beyond this webinar and our communications webinar. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but I just want to highlight a few of these options of actions that you can take. Um, in particular, what our speaker will be really highlighting is advocating for against legislation at the state or local level, um, elevating the profile of your congregation or your, your core group among local political leaders and educating them and engaging them on issues that matter to you. But I also want to point out, um, because if you're interested in doing Get Out the Vote, or voter protection, um, attending county election meetings is a really great action to take because the devil's really in the details in terms of how uh, effective our elections are going to look in November and being on top of what your uh, local offic officials are doing to make uh, voting as accessible as possible is going to be really important. And so that's something that you can do uh, to plug in and, and really make a difference. Um, there's other examples here, um, but I won't go into those now. Again, please reach out to us if you haven't signed up to volunteer. We're happy to discuss all of these options and how we can support you for any of these given actions. And um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of the kind of support that's available to you, uh, we'll assist you with strategic planning and organizing best practices. We have ready to go presentations on some of the issues that I mentioned earlier today. We have educational materials and we have our uh, network of uh, partners that we at the national level, um, but also at the state level through the humanistic uh, Jewish congregations have worked with. And so we can help you do outreach and build coalitions. We can provide technical support, including sharing our Zoom webinar capacities so you can do events like this. Um, and we can also provide uh, branding so that anything that you're putting out there to partners or to elected officials can look clean and professional. Um, so we can provide that branding and national support uh, for anything that you're doing on the ground. And so with that, um, I'm going to leave you with a contact information um, so that you have it uh, for me, the program coordinator, Lincoln and Paul. And I'm going to introduce, I'm very excited uh, to introduce Morgan Carroll. Uh, she is the current chair of the Colorado Democratic Party. She previously served in the Colorado House of Representatives and in the Colorado Senate including a Senate president, majority leader, and minority leader. She has held hundreds of town halls and trainings on how to be a citizen lobbyist. She is the author of Take Back Your Government, A Citizen's Guide to Grassroots Change. And she's an attorney who previously practiced law as an advocate for consumers, civil rights, and people with disabilities. She's now embracing her role to help expand economic and educational opportunities, defend civil rights and liberties, and lead in the resistance. She's also Jewish and had her bat mitzvah at Congregation Har Hashem in Boulder, Colorado. She taught Hebrew for six years at her synagogue and visited Israel on five occasions, including living on a kibbutz. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Morgan. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. 
Um, really excited to be asked to join you guys tonight on this. Um, I wanted to come through with a perspective of just things I guess I wished I would have known uh, before I was in elected office. I think like many of you had a pretty decent education. Um, but uh, most of what we never learned in school was how to actually um, impact the government, you know, three branches of government, but what do we actually do when we wanna see some changes? So um, this was the book, uh, Take Back Your Government, A Citizen's Guide to Grassroots Change. And this was really born out of doing hundreds of uh, trainings on citizen lobbying on a lot of how the inside process works that I felt like we were not doing a good enough job um, letting everybody know their right and their power about how to fully participate in their own government. So um, I guess we obviously start with why. If you are a member or joining this lobby uh, training, you probably are already engaged and know why we are doing this. But I think it's important because apathy is probably the single worst enemy of democracy that we can have both in elections and after elections. So we're here because we care and we want to demystify the process and make it feel completely comfortable and approachable. Know that this whole apparatus really does exist for you and none of it works without you. And I will share some examples on really what I've seen of what happens when there's no citizen participation in the lawmaking as opposed to when it's just paid lobbyists from wealthier special interest groups. Um, in my first year in the Colorado House, I ran a bill. I'll just tell you a little bit of why this really stuck with me early. I ran a bill to give injured workers a choice of doctor. In Colorado at the time, you could choose your car mechanic, your veterinarian, but workers had basically no rights here. And I had been doing a lot of work with disability law. So about 250 lobbyists uh, went to work to defeat the bill. I had nobody helping me pass the bill. And um, I couldn't figure out who they were or who they were lobbying for. And so one of the things I was underprepared for as a new lawmaker was really just how present and powerful that paid permanent lobby corps really can be. And I just got crushed. I mean, I was decimated. Um, they, it took me three years to pass that bill. And the bottom line is what changed is I realized how powerful and important the outside in game really is. Bills that are devised in the beltway or in the Capitol alone um, tend to be very closed in terms of who uh, has input, it distorts thinking, it starts to really twist what people think is normal and what the public wants, and it begins the process of how lawmakers can become so divorced from everyday needs and issues. So what I found was when I pulled in the press and when I started petitions with thousands of people, those same wealthy, same powerful funded interests that were opposing everything I was basically working on, um, I was able to get the votes that I needed that I couldn't just years before. And that outside in strategy is really you as citizens and people getting involved side by side, same legislation, different years. The only different strategy is when I had outside um, regular people participating in the process, it literally changed the outcome and it made me a believer of how much we need to let people know their input changes reality on the ground. Um, so my ultimate why is I do think we have the power and the responsibility to make things better. And from a Jewish values perspective, perhaps tikkun olam, uh, our part in healing the world. So I think one of the first things to think about is there's a lot of issues when you're engaged and you care at a lot and you can't really follow everything, every bill, every issue at every level, but it's helpful to kind of pick a starting point. If you are working on separation of church and state issues, if you're in a state like Colorado right now, we have a blue trifecta that's very defensive of our separation of church and state. But at the federal level, not so much. So if you're working on that, it might mean that you need to do the work on local school boards where they're trying to do 
um, Bible curriculum or do litmus tests or um, interfere with teaching of science. We've seen in many of our local school boards um, sort of a right wing ideological agenda that very much uh, favors a narrow view of one religion over others. And of course, at the federal level and agencies, it's not just Trump and it's not just the Senate, but the rulemaking that they're doing at this point is misusing taxpayer funds and setting up a process that is building in a tolerance of discrimination and um, really religious litmus tests throughout the whole process. So depending on what issue you're most passionate about here will probably inform where you really need to be spending your time. Um, so to the whole topic we are looking at now, really how to make change. Most of what I'm talking about tonight is just to pull back the veil a little bit um, with my 12, four years in the House and eight years of the Senate about how to really make an impact on policymakers. Uh, but you can't do that in isolation without also doing the work to influence public opinion, talking with your own friends and family, your own professional circles, and as Sarah mentioned, the comms training. Um, you really want to make press part of your strategy so that we're changing hearts and minds and law. So as I get into some specific details, I understand there's about 28 different states represented on this call. I'm from Colorado and I know none of our two states are none, no two of our states are exactly alike. But we do have some features in Colorado I want to flag in case your states don't that have a big impact on how much power the citizenry has in your state. Uh, Colorado passed a by ballot measure something called gavel give every legislator a vote in 1974. And this changed our constitution to require that every bill must be introduced, every bill must be given a public hearing, every bill must take public testimony for or against the bill, and every bill must be scheduled for a floor vote. So when we see the graveyard of legislation in Mitch McConnell's Senate, that can't happen in Colorado. But I know states vary. Um, not all states have that. And in terms of looking at good government things that help undergird the rest of the issues we're talking about, it's helpful to do an inventory of your state about what are the rules about how many bills each legislator gets. Do they have to schedule a committee hearing? That will affect your strategy. Um, does every bill have to be scheduled on the floor or can they do that quiet pocket veto where the things they don't like, never see the, the light of day. Do citizens have a right to testify? And how does your state look in terms of open records, open meetings, and how they record business and how the public has a right to access it? Almost all of our states could stand uh, a little bit of improvement in terms of transparency and access. And of course, I do see the connection in my mind between clean campaigns and good governing a lot of daylight on the campaign finance laws so you can really see who's funding what. And uh, Sarah had mentioned get out the vote, but you know, do you have uh, no excuse vote by mail in your state, early voting, uh, mail drop off locations, same day registration. Uh, those are all things that we were able to eventually get through in Colorado with a lot of citizen input. And those have created fertile ground for a good participation, um, just good in a good participation culture uh, in Colorado, not necessarily existing everywhere yet. So because every state is different, what I did on this slide is just, I want to hit that every state's going to have some kind of deadline for when bills need to be drafted and when they need to be introduced. And every state has kind of a default about when their session normally starts or ends. I know in Colorado, we just had a split session because COVID interrupted in the middle of it. We had a constitutional challenge that went to the courts to decide because we're limited to 120 days and the Republicans didn't want any governing. So they were like, while we were out of session for COVID, they wanted those to count against the 120 days. And we were saying, no, this, the people are entitled to 120 working days to solve this. We won that and some states 
they're just all over the map. So you probably already know your state schedule, but if not, I included a link here. Um, NCSL is a great resource I would start off with. Um, that's the National Conference of State Legislatures. And it will give you a side-by-side -side of the schedules for the different states, the rules for the different states. So you can kind of compare your state to others. And I call it shopping for good ideas. You know, I like what the state is doing, not so much with that. So if you wanna compare COVID packages for different states or LGBTQ rights on different states, just um, keep NCSL in mind because they're very, very good at doing 50 state comparisons of policies. So at the local level, um, I, I generally think it's easier to have a direct impact. The more local you are, the closer you are. I have two different columns here where on the left, a state like Colorado, where they have to schedule a hearing and take public input, um, you have so much direct access. You basically can um, either engage just right away. You do not need a public invitation to show up and testify. Um, you just look at the website, look at the calendar, and um, many states are adapting this for COVID right now and are allowing um, online or written testimony. So note here that whatever your state's usual process, it might be changed right now for COVID and check their website to see how they're taking public input. But if you have a state that guarantees a hearing, that means even if you're the underdog, even if you're tackling big reforms with big and well-funded opposition, you will have your day where you can organize with press and with other people to take the case of public opinion and make it so awkward for people to vote against it that you'll find people do change their votes when they've got a camera in their face in a packed room. A uh, quick example on that, we had a bill that was giving um, a right for parents to take time uh, off of work for parent-teacher events at school. And Colorado law used to allow an employer to fire someone if they didn't show up, if they were trying to show up at their um, child's like parent-teacher night. And we had testimony of people from eight years old to 18 to every generation in between talking about how heartbreaking it was to choose between keeping my job and being able to participate in my kids' education. Well, I counted votes before that bill hearing and we did not have the votes. And it was initially very party line. But I'll tell you, there was one eight-year-old girl who came in and just told her story about what it was like to be the only one with her parents not able to go and that she felt bad for her mom, but she knew her mom needed her job. And we flipped two Republican votes in that hearing just on the power of hearing from the kids themselves with TV cameras in their face. And reality was changed in that moment just in the power of, of testimony. If you're in a state that does not guarantee a hearing, you have an added layer of strategy. Because in political practice, it means that you need to, the chair needs to want to schedule it. So you might need a whole strategy on persuading the chair of the committee to calendar your bill. And those chairs might be responding to leadership pressure where this local speaker or senate president is telling them chairs not this bill not this bill so you might need to even take it up a notch and go to the very top leadership of your state chambers to make the case along with your committee chair to even get the bill scheduled because if you don't have a bill scheduled there it's really there's it's hard to organize around an abstract maybe bill that doesn't exist. You might need to organize around, give it a fair hearing. We have a right to be heard, like let's just get a fair hearing. So if you're in one of those states, you do have an added step to really add a thought of how do we get this introduced into the floor. But in any state, once a sponsor says yes, to carry a bill for you. You have access to their nonpartisan drafters. You do not need to be an attorney. 
and you have access to the nonpartisan policy research there. So you don't 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 wait for perfection. You don't have to know every word or even exactly how you want to approach it. You can start with a draft. You can start by searching around and then um, be like, you know, I like this approach better. It's an iterative process. But I know one barrier is people often don't even know that they can introduce bills or how to go about asking their legislators to introduce the bill for them. And um, feeling like, well, it's legalese. I don't really know how to write it. You don't need to know how to do that. There are professional resources out there for you. So I think if any of you are like me, my hardest challenge when I first got elected, in Colorado, we only get five bills unless leadership gives you extra permission. And there's more than five problems in the world. And there's more than five things that I care about. And if you are an advocate out there with this organization, you've just seen a menu of some amazing issues. And it, if you pick too many, or it can feel overwhelming. So I think you start with one. What is closest to your heart? What keeps you up at night? What do you want to do to leave this world a better place? Um, and give yourself permission to just start with one because there's too many issues to try and actually follow them all. And as you get more comfortable with it, you'll start to pick up other issues and this just becomes second nature for how you do your advocacy. But think about what you've had in your personal experience. Stories can really move lawmakers and you are all experts, whether it's your education, your lived experience, your life, your um, work experience that's out there. And that's powerful to help inform policy about how we think the world should be. So when you're picking your issue, think about where you feel comfortable, where you feel passionate, and your goal is to really become a trusted source. Um, not like a one-time email and done or a phone call and done, but you want to get to know your own elected officials to the point where you're in their phone and they're like, oh, there's an issue coming up about uh, special education and funding. And I know a parent who's a really strong advocate for um, high quality education for kids with disabilities. You know, I, I actually need to call this person. You want to become that person. So you're not a one hit wonder, but you become embedded in the process uh, ongoing in the future. So you guys may have known this. Um, I guess I put this up here because some of this was surprising to me. Um, that you as a member of the public can run a bill. And yes, you have to get a lawmaker to do it. But their best ideas usually come from the real world of people with a real problem looking for a real solution. And I think the fact that this is kept from people, if you aren't the one coming up with the ideas on the bill, somebody else is, and that somebody else is usually well-funded, powerful, special interests with people who can afford to hire a lobbyist. So a lot of everyday needs will fall on the wayside if we just assume that someone else is going to actually come up with the bill. So you might be the person you're waiting for. If every state has some way to give input, um, you may or may not be in a state with a guaranteed right to testify. Like in Congress, you need to be invited. Um, Colorado, it's wide open. But in every state, you have either that right to testify or at least the right to weigh in. And that might be your letter writing campaign or your petitions um, or your emails. I mean, letters are basically too slow these days. Um, that might be your phone call campaign. But every legislative body has an input process that should become part of the public record. So quick tip um, when you're writing, we treat constituent communications as confidential unless you tell us you want it to be part of the public record. If in the era of COVID and you can't get down there to testify, but you have written testimony that you want to be part of the record on a bill or on a public rulemaking for federal or state, 
you should say very early right at the beginning that I am writing this as my written testimony to be part of the public record on House Bill whatever or Senate Bill or on this proposed um, rulemaking that's happening. If you don't, the chances are it won't get in the record and the default will be that it's treated as confidential. Um, I think most people I've met really feel like um, that there's access that paid lobbyists have that they don't, that you need to know somebody, that you need to be a VIP, that you need to be well connected. And the reality is, is there is nothing that they do that you can't. I think one of the biggest asymmetries, even, even more than money, would be comfort and familiarity and time. Once we get those barriers down and understand you have every right to feel at home in every level of government, now you're now they have no real advantage over you and your policy preferences anymore. The other myth I guess I want to bust is that this has to be some full-time job. Um, you can you can do your citizen lobbying in as little as 10 minutes a year. 10 minutes a month, 10 minutes a week, maybe it's 10 minutes a day. But time, we're all very busy people. And I think the real point is you get to choose. Everything you do is better than nothing. And so if it's that one action for 10 minutes a year, or if it's as much as 10 minutes a day, or you put even more time on it, that's fantastic. But the idea that you have to somehow be monitoring this every day and doing it on top of your otherwise busy life, um, you really can have a big impact in a fairly short period of time. And, and the point about press coverage is, I guess I grew up thinking that there was press secretaries and um, you know VIPs who did press conferences and they had press releases. Especially in this day and age, any of you can drive a press story. And, and that is powerful um, to really be a force for changing public opinion. So the first tip I would give, and I think some of this will probably be like, yeah, that makes sense, um, but is really make it personal. Um, I've watched when people listen, when my colleagues are you know, distracted off doing something else, when votes were happening, when they're tuned out, when they're tuned in. In one-on-one -on -one meetings, in your testimony, when you're showing up, if you lead with a personal story, um, they will listen better and they will be persuaded more. And the thought about making it personal is, it should be personal to you, but if you can do a little bit of homework on who that person is, before you meet with them, because it might give you a seed of something you have in common, even from someone who doesn't seem politically at all like you. And if you start a conversation or an email with what I think of as a bridge, something human and personal and common, it makes it, the, the persuasion is actually more likely to follow and they're more likely to read it and remember it and pay attention for it. Um, we have very different levels of staff in our different states. Congress is pretty well staffed up, as you guys know. Um, we're pretty lightly staffed, but as in life, you know, so much power really comes to treating staff with dignity and respect. And if you want to get effective communication through to an elected official, treat their staff well and ask them specifically to pass your message on to the elected official and get back to you. Um, it may be that all of your communications wind up being through staff and instead of, you know, I wouldn't be offended by that, that's actually how a lot of work has to get done. Um, but I've seen how some people treat, treated staff of mine kind of with disdain and it really affects um, how I work with a constituent if they treat my staff like that. Um, a meeting, so when you've done the work to see the schedule of when someone's in session or not, it's always going to be more likely that you're going to get time on someone's calendar out of session. And it might be, if you call and ask for an hour meeting, you might never get that asked. Your more successful ask might be to set up a five-minute phone call 
And I know it's really hard to talk about the issues we care about in five minutes, but you are much more likely to get a 15 minute call or meeting than an hour sit down, but ask. And if they say, oh, like I don't have anything available and you've asked for an hour, you'd be like, oh, what about 30 minutes? How about 15 minutes? Can I meet with a staff person? Your goal is relationships, like everything else in life. You want good, positive relationships, and that will help you be persuasive. Um, uh, you know, the indivisible movement has been interesting because we've seen a real growth in the expectation that our elected officials actually hold town halls. Uh, that has been COVID impacted, but so many of them are online now. And I know when I would do town hall meetings, I really recognized the people who were there all the time. Even people who were very, very far on the other end of the political spectrum from where I was. And it just, it was friendly, it was familiar. Um, you know, they knew that if they showed up and I recognized them, it was an easy way for them to flag issues for me or to ask questions. And if they've seen your name, if they've seen your face, if they've seen you repeatedly, that familiarity is going to wind up putting just a tad more weight on your contacts when you're really asking for something like a yes vote or a no vote. And then I know we're overloaded with stuff. But I really recommend signing up for the legislative, congressional, or local emails of any of your elected officials. Follow them on Facebook or Twitter. You will learn slightly different things from different people. But part of what you'll learn is their pet peeves, how they think, what's important to them. Because when you are going to be contacting them, asking them for something. If you know that they are an avid hiker, like in Colorado, and you are too, and you want to open a conversation on parks, that might be a safe way to have a conversation that's ultimately later about separation of church and state or on immigrant rights or something else. So they give you so many clues um, as to who they are and how they operate. And that will help you strategize about how you really want to approach them. So um, I don't think very many people are doing in-person meetings right now, but really just how to reach out. Um, right now, I would say basically phones, email. If you have um, a contact with a staff person in somebody's office, get their name and get ask if there's a number they can receive texts. Um, almost everyone I know sees and responds to their texts a little bit more quickly than emails these days. But you can obviously pull in petitions as a, as a, a path to get their attention. Petitions send not an individual human story, but more like, hey, the masses are with us and you need to be responsive to how many people in your community care. But be careful, there's a lot of fake petitions out there that are really fundraising appeals. And you might think you're signing a petition to keep kids out of cages on immigration rights and realize it's just a list capture. So just check and make sure the petitions you're signing up for are actually getting delivered to specific elected officials on whatever topic you're signing up for. You can also you know, find people on Facebook and um, tweeted them. I would just say that that's very hit and miss. Um, I rarely see people who tag me on Facebook like I do if they text me or call me. But people like Cory Booker live on Twitter. Some people will never see. So if you assume that they're going to see it because you've tagged them, just know you probably need another modality because they may or may not have seen your social media post. So every, um, I, I just think a lot of what we can do is bookmark different sites. Because we're across 28 different states on this call, I just put in the Congress, um, you know, to get to the calendar for the federal. But your uh, state boards, your county governments, your state legislature, all of those are going to wind up having public websites and all of those should have um, a calendar, minutes, um, how to download bills, pending legislation, how people voted. 
Um, in Colorado, we also have at the Secretary of State's office, um, you can also do the research on campaign finance contributions to the different members and also the lobbying activity of exactly who's being paid what by whom to lobby for every bill. Um, and that is very helpful information if you want to understand like your opposition and <laughs> what you're up against. So timing is timing is pretty key. Um, if I, I, I guess the example I would give is the heartbreaking example of emails that sometimes I get after a session of somebody who was really passionate, maybe on a healthcare issue, and I'm getting their email like a week after we've adjourned. And I just like, I barely have the heart to tell them like, oh my gosh, you know, we already voted, like you missed the boat. Um, so on order of operations on timing, ideally you have done a get to know you meeting before you need anything. Ideally your first meeting really doesn't have an ask, it's more of an offer of, I can find one, two or three things you've worked on that I appreciate. Here's one, two, or three things in my background. I want to be a resource to you. Here's my contact information. Let me know if there's ever anything I can do to help. Nice if that first meeting doesn't have an ask. Um, but sometimes advocacy doesn't give you that luxury and you just, you know, need to do what you got to do. You will have more, if you, if you think about um, like a scale on how much weight your input has. You will have more influence before a measure is introduced than after. And you will have more influence before a bill goes to committee than during. And you will have more influence during a committee than after a committee. And um, more influence in committee than by the time you're on a floor vote. And then by the time floor votes are happening, it's basically too late and you're only looking at advocacy to get something signed or vetoed basically. Um, this has been frustrating for some advocates where it's following a calendar is sometimes not easy. So if you are a member of like this organization or the ACLU that does action alerts, sometimes those action alerts are really helpful of like, hey, this bill is coming up tomorrow. We need people to respond today um, so that you don't have to navigate it. But if you bookmarked all those websites, you can find it yourself. So, um, I, you know, it's interesting. There's different, opinion, different opinions about this. Everyone will tell you the best person for you to contact is your own elected representative. They owe you constituent services. They owe you the decency of a response. But I would not say limit your outreach to your own representative. And my advice would be you contact anyone with the power to make the decision you need to make your issue go forward or to make a bad bill stop. So after your representative, it might mean you're reaching out to leadership and those are relationships maybe you wanna cultivate personally as well. Maybe it's the committee chair. Maybe you're now reaching out to the other committee members why? Because they have a vote. And if you really want something to pass, or if you really want something to go down, it's artificially self-limiting to say, okay, well, I'm going to contact my representative and only my representative. You really can uh, contact anybody who has any decision making. Um, I'm going to use Mitch McConnell as an example, uh, like on appointments and confirmations in the Senate. Most of us don't live in Kentucky. So if we were to be too strict about saying only our representative, then what about the other 49 states who have an opinion about who's confirmed to the Supreme Court, especially say where maybe separation of church and state or women's reproductive rights are on the line or immigrant rights are on the line. So you do have to be clever. They have figured out how to capture uh, through their email, your zip code, at the congressional level to basically screen you out, but phone calls and faxes and postcards get through. 
So that's, and also social media. You can tag any public member and you can also tag the press in their community. So it's just a little different strategy, but I think we should contact anybody who has a vote and anyone who has the power to do what we need them to do. Um, I will say that not all advocacy is effective and that's hard to say. Most advocacy is effective, but how we approach people of course really matters. Um, the right and wrong way or tips on this, I have seen 13 page single space, no paragraph things that are really hard to read. I can't tell what they're asking. And that makes it just harder to figure out how to engage or what the response is. So whether it's in writing or in person, you're always better off short. You can always elaborate later. Polite no matter how passionate we are about an issue. Um, the number of things that I have seen that are vitriolic or just you must be an idiot or just threats, terrible, terribly ineffective way to actually, you know, persuade anybody. Um, so what is effective is short, polite, that personal story, maybe three reasons or points or facts to help back up your story please remember to state your ask, um, whether it's in testimony or in letters. I just see a lot of people who, who talk about something, but I can't tell actually if they're wanting a yes vote or a no vote or an amendment or constituent services. And so my advice would be to put your ask at the beginning and to put your ask at the end so it's basically impossible for somebody to miss it. Um, as you do this more often, I think researching the member really matters. Um, the example I would give, we will all have to do advocacy with people who are not the same political party or are, agree with us on different issues. But if you've researched a member, your mind can start to think through different coalitions that might work on different issues. So a colleague of mine who might be a train wreck on pro-choice issues, um, is actually with me on Fourth Amendment search and seizure issues. And by knowing that about a member, um, I'm like, okay, well, I can work with him on this issue. We both oppose warrantless searches. I just, we're not going to be on the same page when it comes to choice. So that kind of nuance, instead of like this person's an ally and this person's an enemy, will really help you vote count even in a partisan or a mixed chamber environment. Um, whole body of research on the psychology of what persuades, the bottom line, frame to their framework. If, um, if they are coming from a place of sort of libertarian small government, your point about personal autonomy and the right for people to make their own decisions might better be framed about the limited role of government um, then in a frame of women's rights. It just depends on who you're talking to. And this, was, this took me a little bit while, a while to see because we all think we're the, always the right messenger, but sometimes there is a better best messenger. Who, pa, we call it power mapping sometimes, but who does this person know that you know that is already trusted by the lawmaker that might have just better listening, a little bit more open to what you have to say. Um, when I was running legislation to end the death penalty, um, there were clergy who, and talking about separation of church and state, right? But there were clergy who opposed the death penalty. And in some of my very religious members that I knew were that, um, I was like, okay, I think I need clergy to speak to this member on that framework for why we should eliminate the death penalty in Colorado. Um, this last point sounds weird, I know, about how they can be a hero, but if you tee up the problem and you lend significance to their vote, their vote that they have a choice, there's a wrong that is on the table, and there is something that you can do today that will be part of making history about writing this wrong and you have this important role i can't do it but i'm here to ask you to do it because you have the power to make something quite amazing and quite important happen um 
this adding significance to your ask helps. Hopefully we don't have to talk about this, but I literally have had, um, you know, threats and insults or people flirting with staff and just like, yeah, you don't want to do that. So just you be professional, even if some elected officials actually aren't. Um, okay, so just quickly on how to testify, I want to demystify this. Um, you would have specifics based on your actual legislature and you would ask a committee chair or staffer ahead of time. But the safest thing I think is to prepare short because you can always elaborate. It has been very heart wrenching to see people show up with like a 30 minute uh, preamble and they're cut off at three minutes and they haven't even gotten anywhere near their point. So um, this right here is actually the photo. Um, I represent Aurora, Colorado. I was the senator here during the Aurora movie theater shooting. And um, so that affected my community. And so we were passing, um, when I was majority leader, we were passing a series of gun safety measures in Colorado. And um, so the picture that's here is during testimony as we were passing universal background checks in Colorado. And that was Mark Kelly before he was running for Senate. And you can just get a sense of a room there of people that are there to come in and testify for against universal background checks and having some kind of table or dais where you're speaking from. It's actually less formal than court, but you know, that's a sense of how it would look. And your sponsors usually sitting there throughout and then different speakers like you as a witness would come up, introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Sarah Levin. I'm here because give your personal story, give your three reasons, and I am asking for you to vote for or against this bill. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And then the chair of the committee will facilitate that. They'll ask the committee if there's any questions for you. They may or may not have questions. Um, and then you're basically done. So it's, it's, um, not hard, but I do think it can be intimidating like the first time you do it. So now you've done all this work, you've contacted your elected officials, you've realized you too can vote count what position each member on the committee are you likely to support, can I count on your no vote, and now you have gone through this process and you've contacted your elected official. I think we should all be thinking in terms of amplification in this day and age. If you call your senator's office and they're not responsive, you put your contact for positive or negative online on social media. I contacted Senator Cory Gardner's office today, got no response. This is the 13th time. Tag Senator Cory Gardner and important press outlets in Colorado. Um, I testified today in support of paid family leave in the time of COVID. I think it's more important than ever that we don't force people to go to work sick, contaminate and expose people to injury or death. Um, this, you know, this committee was great work, you know, yay, we passed the bill, or this person was frankly d disrespectful, hostile, very disappointed in how this person voted. Your power to hold people accountable is almost limitless at this point in time. Um, and so every act you do, whether it's an email, a phone call, a petition, uh, testifying, uh, a press conference, you can then post about it, amplify about it, tag people who you know has a good social media network so you can grow your reach on it. And when you're building your list ahead of time of all your local elected officials, I think every citizen in their toolkit should have their own top press release, press contacts so that they can tweet at them and, and do Facebook or, or send uh, their own version of press releases. So now every one thing you've done, think one, two. You've taken an action and you've amplified it somehow online. Um, this is something that I, I just wanted to mention that following up after a vote, no matter how it goes, I think it's terribly important. 
It is so often we tell people when we're angry with them or we're upset, but it is as important to thank the elected officials that vote the way you have asked them to, as it is to express your disappointment in the ones who do not. That feedback shapes opinions over time. And especially if someone has crossed party lines or taken some political risk in any way, Yes, we'd like to think people would just vote to do the right thing, but acknowledging the appreciation for it uh, goes a long way so that next time the same issue comes up, they're going to feel even better about um, lending their support to where you're at. So um, I can't help but connect elections with governing. I've served in the majority. I've served in the minority. Um, I have seen bills to completely defund public education and put them entirely into private parochial religious schools. I have seen bills that would basically do preventative detention based on racial profiling for suspected immigrants that would have passed depending on who was in there. I have seen the right to discrimination bills um, mostly aimed at LGBT but often there's often religious discrimination in the name of not discriminating against religion. These are all bills that would have passed if we didn't just have the numbers in the legislature to, to crush them. But um, if you start earlier on the campaign cycle and get involved in a campaign with anyone you like, whatever party you are, wherever you, you are at, it's a good way to get to know somebody. Uh, it's a place to build those relationships before they're ever governing and it's a way to stay it's a way to start off involved in the lawmaking process so that we turn from elections right into um, lawmaking i've made a couple other notes here too but you know we vote with our time we vote with our money um, there are cause-based investment funds now if you do not want to invest for example in fossil fuels there's now many, many different ways that you can use your power as an individual uh, to change, to, to force changes, um, even with some of the largest companies and some of the most um, obstinate um, government entities out there. So I want to um, stop there and I think just turn it over to questions and um, See, Sarah, if we have any questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Rick who asked, how can we identify how to be of help, uh, excuse me, of help to the officials so that they can help us? Oh, I love this question. You, um, so especially at the local level, they're short on staff. So one way you can offer to help is to do research to share well-sourced articles. If you don't give them sources of good information, they're probably just getting information from lobbyists and paid interests. So one way to help is to get good information in front of them and their staff. The other might be to volunteer for an hour uh, if you have the time or lifestyle that allows you to um, help in with the office, to, to respond to mail, phone calls. Um, at every level of government, almost any elected official is short on time and takes volunteers, not just on the campaign, but in their office. Um, they might need organizing help. So let's say they want to do a bill with you or you like a bill they're doing, but they have limited bandwidth. So let's say one way you could help is brainstorming like, well, I can think of other organizations who should be interested in this issue, too. Can I reach out to them? Would it be helpful if I reached out to them? And now we can grow our coalition for or against. They, they, in a perfect world without 800 other bills going on, they probably would be fine doing it all themselves. But if you offer to be like, oh, man, I've got some great witnesses who have some powerful stories on this. I have some ideas of other groups. What do you think? Can I go reach out? Any of those kind of things are truly helpful <laughs> to any elected official. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, I have another question from Barbara, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm understanding her question. So Barbara, if I'm getting it wrong, let me know. She was asking, 
uh, if you post negatively, and I think what she meant was uh, online, uh, like say your example of, you know, I've, I've uh, contacted uh, Senator Gardner's uh, office 13 times and a response. Uh, she asked, are you at risk? You know, what, what is the risk of doing that? I guess of blowback. Yeah, I like her question because there's an art to accountability. If you are, um, you know, if you use ad hominem attacks, if you're like, so he's a sleazeball and he's a dirt bag and whatever, that will backfire. Eventually, if seen, it will mean anything else that comes out of your mouth in their office is just going to be like, oh, well, it's her, not me. She's just like that. So even though number 45 does name calling all the time, for the rest of us, you know, that accountability should stop short of anything that looks like a personal attack. But stating facts is always fair. If you've called 13 times without a response, it is totally fair to say, I have called 13 times and I have not gotten a response. I am disappointed. Um, he's a dirt bag and a waste droid and can't wait to get him out of office. You know, if you're not really going to be doing legislative advocacy, like maybe that feels good and, and is fine. but um, you're right, there is a line on how you expose a bad vote, which is why I, I, I feel like it's usually safe to talk about disappointment. I hope, he'll, I hope he or she will reconsider. I really hope next time uh, when this issue comes up, like, you know, this, that this person will reconsider. I'm just very disappointed. That won't backfire. That actually is pretty effective. Great, we just got another question from Victoria. Do elected officials have staff check on the asker prior to deciding whether they can meet? I always assumed yes, for example, whether I'm a donor or supporter. Oh, so for most people, the answer is no. Um, I would say most elected officials and staff don't have time or resources to even check that. You know, are there some who might? I can't say that there aren't any, but um, when on the governing side of anything that we got in Colorado, I started with whoever was in my district, whatever their political inclinations, if I knew them or not, if they were a donor or not, did not matter. What did matter is, because I would use my rules in my email folder because I get like 2,000 emails a day. So if it was, you know, someone from Aurora, Someone with the words vote for, or against, or help in there, I kind of pull that into a special rule in my email. And I didn't know, most people had never donated uh, that I'd never met and that I didn't know. And so I, I would say most of us feel like we just need to respond to whoever contacts us. Um, so I think it would be a barrier. Like if we assumed we had to be a donor to do that, I think it would keep a lot of people from even reaching out. And at least in my experience, in my state, no, no. They, if you donated every month, they probably would remember your name and be like, Ooh, maybe I should like make a point to get back. But I don't know anybody, at least in our state, who is like, well, I don't know you and you didn't donate, so I'm not gonna write you back. It's Paul, I have a question. And first of all, thank you so much because this was really helpful. Um, I'm personally, I'm very deeply challenged by your recommendation not to be cynical. That's gonna be a hard one for me. But I, I appreciate hearing it and I, I'll try to do that. Uh, you know, and you touched on some of the, you know, quote unquote, religious freedom issues that come up. And of course that's where we're trying to put our focus. And we're also trying to, I think, bring with us our Jewish values and Jewish identity. Um, how, how would you see that working its way in, or has that ever worked in for you when you're discussing issues like that? Yeah, like, so for me personally, um, it has a lot. Um, so the first thing that to me feels like it's part of my Jewish identity and how I respond is I just feel it at a, 
religious level of an obligation not to be on the sidelines while other people are suffering. So to me, it's like a religious commandment that if I see someone is being persecuted, if there's an imbalance of power, if somebody's human rights and dignity, it's like not optional. It's just a necessary from my faith perspective to be there, even if, um, you know, in the case, for example, of the after the Aurora movie theater massacre that was there, um, I mean, I got nine credible death threats for running that bill. But the harm to the world that came out of that or the need to repair the world or to keep tikkun olam for me in that moment meant that when I was looking at those families who so needlessly lost their loved ones coming from so much hate, that we had an obligation, a moral obligation, to go through the exercise of is there anything at all we can do to make sure, to try and make sure this doesn't happen to another family. Um, so like, um, for those of you who follow like Martin Buber, even though it's more on the philosophical vein, the humanizing versus dehumanizing aspect of how we treat other people to me is rooted in faith uh, as, as part of my Jewish faith experience. Um, and so I, I'm, it makes me look at legislation of, is anybody being otherized? Is anyone being demonized? Um, and even in the place of like corrections, where sometimes it might not be a sympathetic audience, if you believe in some notion of redemption or in the ability of a person to learn and change, you would approach corrections very, very differently than if you're fire and brimstone and you think, you know, these aren't really human beings, they've lost their humanity and just toss them out. So on almost every issue where the treatment of other human beings, and frankly, even how I view the treatment of the planet, our responsibility to um, leave the world a better place than where we found it, um, to you know, think through sort of the first they came for, you know, that that we're all familiar with. Um, we have a heightened obligation to be at the front end of identifying who's being singled out and who's being targeted in any dehumanizing way. And I think that means we have to be there on the front lines for asylum seekers, for kids, for immigrants. Um, I would say for people with disabilities, anybody who might not have the power to fully advocate for themselves. In my worldview, faith drives an obligation. It's not just like a yes, no vote. It's, it's, um, it's a requirement. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to um, wrap up? I think so. Um, I don't see any other questions um, as of now. Um, so just want to say thank you again, Morgan, for, for joining us. This has been fantastic. Um, and I'm sure uh, there's lots of folks who are excited to take all of your advice and put it into action. So I'll just remind everybody uh, to please sign up if you haven't already to be a volunteer for Jews for Secular Democracy. I did post in the chat the link to that. I'm also uh, right now uh, sending you the YouTube channel so that you can check out some of, the, some of the webinars I had mentioned earlier so you can get a sense of the kind of issues that we've been discussing. Um, and if you have any questions about any of the material covered today or about the program, you can contact me at sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at jfasd.org. Thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you again, Morgan, and we'll be in touch with all of you soon. All right, bye guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Go Thank organize. You. <laughs>